Take one. Folks, welcome back to part two of Charles Rower's Art of Defense on Foot. My name's Miles Kinney from MSS Moncton, and I want to say thank you so much to everybody who checked out part one. Um, hey, it was really, really cool. We got so much positive feedback from the community, and that's a really, really big deal for us. Um, beyond that, we're going to be moving on to part two today. Part two is, well, it's the real meat and potatoes. Of, of the manual, okay? And part one, that was practice at the target. Practice at the target is exactly what it sounds like, but there's only so much you can practice at the target. Part two is where we move on to practice with the antagonist, okay? And this is where the system really starts to come to life. Right now, we're in part two, section one, which is general observations. In general observations, Roworth gives us the single best drill that I have ever seen in a HEMA source. We're going to break that down for you, we're going to expand on it, we're going to talk a little bit about how it can be plugged into any source that you're studying. Beyond that, we're also going to be talking about his general observations. His general observations are basically good advice <laughs> and things that don't necessarily fit into other sections of the text. Um, we won't be creating drills around those so much, but I think you're going to find them pretty interesting because they're just little pieces of advice that you're going to need to really be effective inside the system. Beyond that, slice like, slash subscribe, do all the stuff you're supposed to do, and don't forget, right underneath us in the description, we have links to the full curriculum, the syllabus, the lesson plans, the drill master list, and of course, Rower's original manual. Check those out, download them. We've got everything you need to get your study group started off the ground practicing broadsword, saber, and single stick. Without further ado, folks, let us begin. In part one, we covered the useless middle guard, the exceptionally useful inside and outside guards. But of course, there's more guards than that in Rower's system. Today, we're going to ta start taking a look at those. We're going to be covering the half-hanging guard first and foremost. Now, I know as we work through these, you're going to be wondering, but Miles, what about the hanging guard? What about St. George's guard? We're going to talk about those later, but they deserve their own section, and Roworth goes in-depth on them later. There's quite a bit to say, but with the half-hanging guard and the half-circle guard, there's quite a bit less to say, and those are the ones we're going to be talking about today, starting with the half-hanging guard. Let's take a look at this half hanging guard. So, it's half of a hanging guard. <laughs> You're just going to be holding your hanging guard a little bit lower and with the blade a little bit pointed more towards the ground and with the stirrup or the basket about chin level, a little bit below chin, okay? Of course, you might have to play with the level on this one a little bit, but Roworth is clear he wants, he doesn't want it above the chin. So, you have the half hanging guard. Now we're going to introduce you to the half circle guard. Let's take a look. The half circle or spadroon guard. Now, Roworth does caution you with this one that, you know, it's not the strongest guard to receive a strike on, but you know what? It actually feels fantastic when parrying cut three, and he gives you a specific context to use it. He wants you to be using that when you disengage from the inside, and we're going to show you how to do that shortly. So we're going to start drilling moving between guards. This might seem really straightforward, but I want you to practice moving that half hanger from the inside to the outside. Roworth makes a distinction, so we're going to make a distinction. Of course, you might need to adjust position really based upon the context of the situation. Beyond that, in our third movement, we're going to be moving between all five guards that we've moved so far. The inside, the outside, the two half hangers, and of course, that half circle guard. We want to be able to move between them all smoothly. Next up, we're going to be looking at something really important to drill, and it's going to be 
how we're going to be parrying cut three. First off, from the outside guard, we're going to be moving to the inside half hanger by dropping the point. We really don't want any unnecessary point movement here. Snap that point straight down or it's going to be too slow. Next up, we're going to be looking at how we're going to be moving into our half circle guard from the inside. And really, we want you raising that hilt. You can be tempted to cut into it like you're throwing a strike three and sort of ending up in a left ox position. But we really want you more lifting the hilt and dropping the point because that's going to get you a lot faster and get you protected a lot easier. Last week, we talked about parrying cuts one and two with the inside and outside guard. In fact, we talked about how you can pretty much parry anything with the inside and outside guard. The inside and outside guard are awesome, but as we delve deeper into rower system, we can see that, you know what, the inside and outside guard actually aren't always ideal for everything that we're trying to do. Today, we're going to be taking a look at how we can take the two guards that we just learned, the uh, half hanging guard and the half circle guard and how we can start to plug those into cuts three, cuts three and four, and cuts five and six. We're going to be starting with cut three parried two ways with the half hanger and with the half circle. Let's get started. We're going to start off by practicing rower's two disengagements to parry cut three. All right, the very first one we're looking at is that outside guard into the inside half hanger. And you see, we really need to drop that point quickly to make it work out. Paul knows what's happening, and it's still a near thing, <laughs> right? This one comes in fast, and, uh, you know, I really think that you're going to need to drill this one to dial it in nicely. Next up, we're going to be looking at our disengagement from the inside to the half circle or spadroon guard. And again, uh, this is actually great. I gotta say, like this, this feels like a really strong parry. It's highly situational, though, so you really need to drill the situation where you're going to be using it. And you'll see that, that Paul asked me to switch, but I actually think that Paul's parries looked really, really good. I think they might have looked better than mine. The real key here, I think, is not getting that, not getting that hilt up too high and really nailing it on the strong of your blade. Nice job, you parried cut three. Next up, we're going to take a look at alternating between cut three and four using just the half hanging guard. It might seem simple, but every little bit is worth practicing. Parrying three and four with the half hanging guard. Of course, this is really straightforward, guys. So you can see, I'm just hanging out my half hanging, and I'm moving it back and forth. This is a really great opportunity to be studying what your opponent is doing. This is something Rower talks about a lot. Starting slow, taking the time to really just watch what the other guy is up to. How is he launching his attacks? How is he powering them? What are his telegraphs? That's really important. Okay, now we start to get a little more complicated, all right? So, we're going to start with the inside guard into the half circle, then move over into our outside half hanger, all right? This one will take you a minute to dial it in, but it's totally worth drilling any time that you can drill those transitions uh, between these two against three and four is great, because three and four are really common combo openers, all right? Um, I know we use them all the time. You probably do, too. Excellent work. You can parry cuts three and four, but can you parry cuts five and six? <laughs> Let's take a look, folks. Well, I'm sure you're saying, well, yeah, I can. And I'm sure you can, but we're going to take the time to drill it, okay? Uh, it's always important to do these things for everybody, all right? And in particular for the person defending, I really want you studying the difference between the three and the four and the five and the six, how they're launching it and the blade trajectory. I think this is studying this is something that's really going to help you out in your practice. <laughs> it 
It's funny, this is the most important drill in rowers material, <laughs> and I forgot to record an intro for it. So what he does here is he lays this out really clearly. He says, an attacker and defender. The attacker calls a number, pauses, and attacks. The defender moves into the appropriate guard based on his table in part two, section one. Then you start to increase speed as you go through it. That's movement two, is increasing the speed between the number called and beginning the movement. Finally, the attacker doesn't say anything and the attacker just starts launching the cuts. Here we're doing it in a set pattern so that we could film it pretty efficiently. This was a long shoot, okay? And honestly, we were starting to run out of gas. In your practice, I want you just launching whatever cuts you want, all right? Just make sure you're starting slow, moving fast later, and you're studying how they are launching the attack. That's the most important thing, studying them. This was our last shoot of the night. <laughs> So, remember those general observations that we talked about at the start of the video? We're going to be getting a little more in-depth on them right now, okay? First off, we're going to start with returning to guard from a strike. After that, we're going to look at withdrawing after throwing cuts 3 and 4, and a nice little general rule to follow when you're throwing cuts 3 and 4. On top of that, we're going to talk about how we're going to direct the strong of the blade as we're cutting into the opponent's sword. And finally, we're going to wrap up with, well, what we're doing with this thing while we're striking. Let's check it out. We're going to start off recovering to guard on the line that you threw a cut. This is best shown using cuts one and two from the inside and outside guard. Here from the inside guard, I'm launching a one and recovering to the inside guard. Really important skill to practice. Highly recommend it. Next up, we're going to be moving to throwing cut two from an outside guard and recovering to that same guard. Roworth mentions quite a few times how important it is to be recovering to a guard with your blade opposing theirs. So it's something that, and specifically the edge opposing theirs, so it's something that you can never practice too much. It's a really fundamental movement, and it's great, and it's effective, and I recommend it. Roworth also talks quite a bit about how to recover from cuts three and four, and he makes a really clear distinction here with cut three. I'm only applying the final four inches of the cut and recovering to the inside guard. This is Roworth's specific instructions. He tells you if you apply more than four inches of the guard that you need to be recovering under cover of the half circle or spadroon guard, which I think I'm going to switch over here to in just a moment. I was kind of trying to dial in my movements because they, well, they weren't the cleanest. <laughs> there it is. And you can see that I'm uh, actually pretty well protected against a ripost um, underneath the cover of that half circle when I've applied too much of the point. And it's a, a really great action, and it starts to become pretty clear when you begin applying it in your um, when you begin applying it in your sparring. Next up, we're going to be looking at cut four, and cut four. He wants you recovering to that outside guard. All right, if you only apply four inches of the point. Beyond that. If you apply more than four inches of the point, he wants you recovering to the hanging guard. I know we didn't go in depth on the hanging guard this week. We're going to do it in a later week because there's a lot to say and there's some really specific drills that I want you doing when it's time for you to practice the hanging guard. But you can see that I'm recovering under it right there. You know, hey, maybe it's a little bit exaggerated, but I actually really enjoy practicing exaggerating exaggerated drills whenever I'm, you know, doing my drilling practice. Um, because you always devolve, you never rise to the occasion. Rower tells us that the hilt carrying across the line of defense and intersecting the opponent's blade can help keep us safe unless they're pretty darn fast. And we can see this in practice right here. And I think some of, you know, my 
KDF practitioners might be seeing sort of some familiar concepts here, but I'm going to digress because I, I don't want to talk too much about uh, medieval systems while we're talking about row earth. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about medieval systems as we work through this. So Roworth, he tells you that if you retract your arm and lift your arm while you're preparing a cut, you're exposing yourself to that exact same cut. And it's really apparent with cut one. Look at this. I'm retracting and lifting my arm to throw my one, and I'm leaving myself wide open to Paul's one. When I first started looking at this, I tried to plug it into Dusak, um, preparing to throw a Zorn by crossing the face, right? And I thought I kind of had something going because it was going to leave me open, but of course, uh, that was an incorrect interpretation. Because you'll see here in a moment that it leaves me open to Paul's two cut and his six cut. Which, you know, I I'm trying to cut a one cut, so it doesn't really fix the, um, fix, it doesn't really fit the, the text here, right? There we go, and there's Paul feeding that in there. But you'll see that when I, we try to plug it in here, you might look at that and go, oh, that's a good idea. It's actually not a great idea, because do you know what's actually going to happen in this situation? A double. <laughs> a double's going to happen, right? Nobody wins. Well, if you're in a tournament setting, I mean, I guess the guy getting in the head, getting hit in the head loses a point. Um, you know, which which is fine if you're gaming the rules like that. But if you're looking for clean fencing, that this is not a good application of technique. It's going to be a lot cleaner doing it row or sway, okay? And we can see when Paul really dials it in here in just a moment that there it is, right there. This is how I like to see this applied, all right? With a little bit of body movement, that's awesome. Folks, you made it through to the end. Nice job, and look at that. It wasn't half an hour long this time. As we go along, we're going to try to get a little bit more to the point with these. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you join us back in two weeks for part three, where we delve even deeper into row or work. Beyond that, I want to thank Paul for helping me out today. I want to thank all of you in Himaland for your contributions and feedback. And, uh, hey, I hope you slash like. I hope you slice subscribe. I hope you join us back here. We've got lots of cool stuff coming back. We're going to be doing a how-to on how to make the stirrup guards. We're going to be giving you the patterns. And hey, we've even got some cool new t-shirts coming out. All right? Peace, gang.